the Eastern Edge. My name is Rachel. I'm the project lead of Art as a Tool for Change. And today we're having our artist talks with our wonderful artists, Ethel, Nassim, and Violet. So I'm going to start off with a late acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the land in which we are occupying is the unceded and ancestral homelands of the Beotuk, and that the island known as Newfoundland is the homeland of the Mi'kmaq and the Beotuk. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of New Nazi'abut. <laughs> come in, you can come in. Okay. And Nunatukabut and the Inuit of Metaxanan, the original people of Labrador. This acknowledgement is a commitment we practice in action, striving for respectful relationships with all people across Turtle Island as we work to challenge ongoing colonization. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome our first artist, Patrick. Okay, so should I stand here or like the students can hold my hand? You can sit if you want, or stand. Oh, okay. I'll yeah. just sit. Okay, wow. There's like no support. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. My name is Violet Drake. I'm one of the three artists in residence here um, with the Artists Actual for Social Change project. Um, so, my creative background is uh, I started creating visual art and uh, writing poetry when I was 13 years old. Uh, I'm a white settler, disabled, queer trans writer, visual artist, actor, and activist, born and raised in the small coastal community of Lawn, Burr Peninsula, like I just said. Um, I'm now based in St. John. Uh, my experimental practice has been self taught since you. Uh, so the type of poetry that I have always uh, written has been hybrid in form. Um, I like to mix and match both traditional uh, rhyme schemes and rhythm with uh, contemporary confessional style of poetic themes uh, and impact. Um, I also have been uh, designing mixed media digital illustrations since I was 13 as well. Um, so I think right there. Uh, that predominantly all of my work as a multidisciplinary artist blends life narrative, land based photography, self portraiture, performance, and autoethnography. Uh, and all of this is housed within my contemporary um, framework of transcorporeal cartographies and existential ecologies. Those are really big academic words that I'll break down later. So, my early work as a visual artist, uh, these are two pieces, one from 2013 and one from 2014. So, um, like any good little queer teenager, I was obsessed with uh, pop stars and pop divas. So, um, a lot of my earliest uh, visual art practice surrounds um, pop stars and digital multimedia collage of combining um, photography from other photographers and um, stock photography that I could download that was under a Creative Commons license um, online. Um, so it didn't take me very long until I grew out of this practice uh, into um, incorporating myself and my own body into my work and, and uh, trying to expand my horizons into uh, my own original photography. So this is a piece from 2017 of years few years later that features me as the subject uh, with, again, stock photography, um, a, like hand edited and worked uh, by myself, but nevertheless, uh, this is a building upon what I was doing years prior. So from 2017 into 2021, um, I started, so from 2014 until 2018, I created 50 original visual art prints. Um, on my own as a hobby, uh, something that I was just doing in my uh, bedroom whenever I felt like it. I wasn't making any money off of it, and it was just something that I wanted to do independently on my own for my own spiritual sense of creation. Um, but moving from then up until 2021, there was a like immense period of growth and artistic development moving from something that I'm doing in my bedroom for fun into something that I'm doing in my home office that is my job. Uh, and so this two highlighted uh, like series that I wanted to highlight here at the top is my project Estrogenesis, uh, which is a series of nine pieces that I created that uh, 
were paired with a collection of poetry that I released in 2019, but I predominantly made all of this work in like 2018. So I say here, in the sequence of nine images, I manipulate a color of each flower into an augmented organism who is a grown of its body and this world that we share. Um, this work uh, was paired with a lot of poetry about my own experiences as a young uh, trans woman sex worker here in Newfoundland. Um, and so both the, uh, all of the imagery here, as well as a lot of the poetry, uh, was inspired by cell membranes, photosynthesis, and transsexual embodiment. Uh, and like I say, this was part of my multimedia poetry uh, collection in Pulse with Little Extra Doses. Um, so again, this was me taking a pre-existing stock photograph, uh, photograph uh, manipulating it, uh, manipulating the colors by hand, but still relying on someone else's pre-existing work and then mishmashing it um, however I saw fit. So this changed two years later into my seminal project called Siren. So this project uh, saw a growth period for me where no longer did I rely on someone else, uh, someone else's um, base images or base raw material. Instead, I wanted to push myself even further and utilize my own photography. So this whole series, uh, this is the triptych series. Um, depicting the horror escapes and dreamways of a mad queer and trans sex worker who finds herself here in the island. Um, so this, everything you see here is based on a selfie that I took on my really old, broken down, ancient iPhone SE. And I uh, digitally manipulated it uh, by hand and through base um, Photoshop filters. Uh, so this saw a, I made a mistake here, it says 2019, it should say 2021. Um, but two years later, going from the Estro project into this, um, I wanted to push myself even further and start warping images uh, a lot more strategically and to create uh, and play with ideas of symmetry and perfection and imperfection, which you can clearly see in the, in the middle image here. Um, you know, the lines that are carved into this image play with symmetry. But if you look closer and closely, not the left side and the right side don't exactly fully align and mimic each other, uh, especially with the warping image, the way it moves in the middle. Um, I wanted to play around with the ideas of symmetry and that kind of thing. Um, so, like I say here, enveloping only one image, uh, the surrealism invites us into a dimension where we not only bear witness to the transcorporeal trauma that haunts the subject, but also to begin to imagine what can be born from the line of dreams hereafter. So what I mean by that is, when I made this uh, piece, this was uh, created through one uh, self-portrait of me when I was uh, in the midst of a gender crisis, uh, where I didn't really uh, know if I wanted to continue transitioning into womanhood or not, so I started identifying as non-binary, which is something that I have uh, identified as uh, since I was a teenager. Um, and so this gender and psychic schism, I wanted to illustrate uh, rawly by using a self-portrait, but then manipulating it uh, in certain ways. Um, so when I created this piece, uh, and this series I should say, uh, my artistic practice grew so much where I, when I, as I was creating Siren, I started thinking about what I wanted to say, what I wanted to do, and what all of it meant in a world as an artist. I wanted, I began thinking about world making as an artist as opposed to I'm just creating one little thing after another. I started to think about my own artistic canon um, with this. So when I created, well, as I was creating this, this piece, Siren began me thinking about my theoretical development as an artist. And so this theoretical development forms the basis of who I am and my contemporary practice today. So, um, since 2011, I've been a student of sociology and gender studies at Mon under the incredible mentorship of Vicki Helen, uh, pictured there as uh, the top left, um, Sonia Moon, who's at uh, the top middle, and Nicole Power, who's in the top uh, right there. Um, through the incredible mentorship of three of these academic um, feminists here at Moore University, 
I have learned so much about the insight and power of feminist queer and transgender theory. I was shown the legacies of writing, art, and culture created by feminist trans people and queers all around the globe and also in Plan Labrador that I didn't even know existed when I was creating art beforehand. Um, so, um, most notably, amongst the people that I encountered in my studies um, are shown in the middle row here, which first picture is Audre Lorde, who um, I found immense strength uh, in uh, the idea of truth as an artist and the power in uh, telling your own truth and developing your own voice and not being afraid of your own truth as an artist. Uh, Kate Bornstein, who is pictured in the middle there, uh, and um, her work as an artist really solidified my appreciation and inspiration of the idea of fluidity and uh, you know not being afraid of dichotomies and playing around with them uh, and destabilizing um, hierarchies of difference in, uh, and illustrating that and highlighting that as uh, a similar piece as myself uh, for my own art as an artist. And then third, uh, would be uh, the work of Morgan Page, who's depicted there in the uh, last image in the second row. Um, Morgan is an incredible archival artist who uh, it doesn't shy away from transgender and sex working histories and the intersection between trans women sex working artists and how each of those independent identities are not as independent as we think and that sex work for many, many trans, uh, like trans feminine artists in Canada and more broadly around the globe, sex work is a core, crucial bedrock of how a lot of artists, including myself, have supported ourselves in creation periods where we cannot rely upon institutional supports such as galleries and uh, grant funding bodies. Um, so, through the pedagogy of compassion, incredible wisdom, and an unyielding uh, belief in me as a student with uh, the uh, academics of uh, Christian Matagro, as well as the lessons and inspiration that I found in the uh, second row of artists, um, I started to develop my own voice as an artist. Contemporarily joins a new, like an emerging wave of cultural production led by, uh, or not led by, but um, in conversation with and in uh, colleagueship with visual artists and also many, uh, both of them are also writers, um, who are new my based artists uh, depicted in the third row, um, all of whom are also queer and transgender as well. Uh, so depicted is David Jeffries, who's also here as a sister of mine supporting me. Um, Kai Bryan, who is an incredible force in the arts community here, as well as Jason Wells. Um, all three of these artists, I see as direct um, friends and family of mine here in the city. Uh, without them, my work uh, wouldn't mean as much as it does, and I wouldn't feel compelled to uh, produce uh, art at, at, at the caliber that I think that I am successful at today. So, like I said earlier, uh, the two theoretical concepts that I focus on the most in my art today are transcorporeal cartography and existential ecologies. So what that means for me is, an academic called Stacey uh, Alamo uh, coined the term transcorporeality, which basically means pertaining to fluidity between material and theoretical bodies, challenging dualities and dichotomies. Trans transcorporeality assumes inter and interconnections, interactions, entanglements, and transits between human and other than human bodies. So that's really the fancy talk for everything is connected. We as humans are not superior over non-human life in uh, the world in which we inhabit. Uh, and that traditionally, anthropocentrism has been uh, depicted in and out of art, and that I think that uh, you know this is a problem and it should be pushed back against both in and outside of art. Uh, so of particular interest to me is the maps of meaning that we place upon human bodies, non-human bodies, and how these structure of uh, semiotics or meanings uphold systems of oppression and climate destruction. So why do we differentiate, differentiate ourselves along uh, race, gender, uh, class, etc., and how do contemporary and historical depictions of this reinforce um, systems of oppression? And so ultimately, in so far as the, this theoretical concept is concerned with my work, I ask, can we create and follow alternate maps of meaning outside scripts of injustice, environmental extraction, and anthropocentrism? 
So these th this question is connected to uh, Stanley Gabbold's uh, dialectical concept of existential ecology. And so I read here, Sally Hill's dialectical concept culminates in its original concern. How do we locate human existence and reconcile nature and home in and outside of art? So for Go, the theoretical is existential and nature is a lived, uh, is lived rather than objective whole. Nature is and has always been an irreducible web of relations experienced from within instead of outside. So what that means for me is, in my art, I try to uh, blend the non-human and the human together in conversation and in a stasis, or, or uh, not static, but in a stasis that is hybrid and chimeric in nature, which is my attempt to destabilize these categories of human and non-human and try to creatively illustrate that we are all living creatures and beings uh, in our world, in our natural world, and we need to take care of this world a lot better than what we are so that we can continue legacy of our art and communal living as a species and as all inhabitants of the earth. So that's all that fancy come. So with all this being said, all of this combined has given me great um, artistic development uh, and vision to produce uh, the work that I'm producing lately. So um, a lot, all of this work has been created in COVID. Um, I don't mean that, uh, I didn't feel that COVID really affected my creativity in a negative way. I felt that it actually affected my creativity in, in a positive way because I'm naturally very introverted and sensitive as a person. And having the time from, to slow down and not participate in social life and instead look and work inward allowed me to create a, a lot of art. Um, so two, uh, pieces that I, uh, two series that I wanted to highlight here is first um, a series that I made uh, this summer that just passed called For Water and Emphasis. So this uh, series, so I selected just four images here. This series is actually 50 visual prints, uh, but I just selected my four favorite. Uh, so this series was created independently on my own with no purpose other than I just wanted to challenge myself artistically to see uh, can I, with all that theory in mind, combined with my own technical growth over the years, could I create something that I would personally feel proud of being shown in a gallery here? So that was my own individual goal. Uh, so uh, this series was uh, shown, a set that was shown in the Unscripted Tony Day Artistic Festival uh, here uh, that just happened in the summer. And so, um, for modern emphasis, it's a mixed media series of visual art interweaving imagery of the human body, the environment, and the non-human with narratives of abiogenesis, queerness, and transness. So what I mean by that is, this uh, series is also created through one selfie that I took on my old iPhone that I enveloped and warped uh, over and over and over, sometimes by hand, sometimes uh, just by filter, into creating something new and uh, using my body, my, a digital depiction of my body, as paint to digitally paint something new and different. So through this process, I aim to rework our understanding of queer and trans embodiment of the present and reimagine gender and sexual diversity of the past. Um, so all of the imagery throughout this series, particularly in these four uh, images, uh, you know, call to Newfoundland uh, sea life, uh, but also underwater vegetation. It could also, uh, you know, call to microscopic uh, cells and like uh, a biogenesis narratives of, you know, if we all came from, you know, this life that is inhabited in the microscopic sea, if this is true, what would that look like, uh, you know, creatively? And if, uh, you know, if it is true that we all came from these cells and from this process, Queer and trans people, so too, are also coming from that same process. So, you know, this is an attempt, uh, you know, for me to humanize queer and trans people, but also the color palette that I select is, you know, mixing cool tones and really bright purples and, uh, you know, like a green, like a greenish blue, which is kind of washed out here on this like thing, but I've never realized. Um, mixed with the fleshy and body tones of my human flesh with like the light pink and like the yellow 
uh, color of my skin uh, in the in the photo. So both in the color palette and the imagery that I'm trying to depict, it's my way of again trying to blend the human and the non-human, um, that type of uh, thing. Both the humanity of the land as well as that which exists below in the sea. So this hybridity of that which is, that which is above and so below culminates into my latest work, which is the project associated with this um, with uh, this ex exhibition of, for this project. So my part of that, alongside the theme of this theme and Heckel's work, my project is called Little Fluids. So um, Little Fluids uh, is a multimedia digital painting and poetry series born from my interest in queer bodies, again, the environment, and uh, more interestingly, uh, trans readings of science fiction and horror cinema. So um, I've always been a long-term fan of horror, particularly slasher film and um, the like alien type of uh, like uh, science fiction films around aliens. Um, so throughout this series, I probe the poetics and the critical potential between three fluids that I've selected. These fluids being blood of the human body found on land, water which is found below us, and extraterrestrial amniotic fluid, which in my theoretical realm exists above us, far beyond the stars. So the themes that are found in this uh, work uh, that emerge are, again, multicellular and primordial life, illustrated through human blood on the land, seascapes among the Earth's vast oceans, and alien metamorphosis between us uh, within the celestial realm. So, the full series is this following image. So this is what is out in the gallery right now, if you want to see it in person. Um, so, what I did with this uh, project is I wanted to push myself even further uh, because I am a Scorpio, I love to do one up myself every single time. So, I said, okay, how can I take my practice to the next level and combine and converge that which exists off the screen, through the screen, and then bring it in and embody it outside of the screen again. So what I did was I hand painted these nine, uh, these nine, uh, like they look like rectangles on this projector, but they're supposed to be like a little tiny bit more square, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, these uh, are nine hand painted illustrations that I painted. I painted the three on the left. With synthetic blood, I use synthetic. I use synthetic, synthetic blood as a paint, and then I painted the other six with acrylic paint. Um, so I hand painted these illustrations. I scanned them and then layered them here as a uh, series of three triptychs. Then I took the scans and I digitally manipulated them and used the, the hand painted uh, the hand painted paintings uh, as paints to digitally paint a larger illustration to house the, these triptychs within their own illustrative world and realm. Then I wanted to combine them all as a larger triptych to create a, uh, like a depiction of my, what I envision as a accurate depiction of my theoretical framework, which is that which is the highest above, which is the celestial realm, that which is all land, which is depicted in the human fleshy corporeal tones of the work on the left, and then that which is all below, which is centered here in the middle, which is water. Um, so I paired three of these uh, larger digital paintings with three uh, poetic uh, musings that I tried to poetically illustrate each piece individually, but then I learned with the wording and uh, the choices that I made poetically, so that when you read them all together, they tell a larger story and they create a larger narrative that I uh, wanted to uh, poetically encapsulate and accurately depict, like my theoretical framework of transcorporeal cartographies as well as existential ecologies. So. Is that like I'll just let this be on the screen until everyone feels like they're ready uh, because the next slide is just closing. So I'm like I guess I'm finished now. What I wanted to say. Um, so is everyone good? Like can I just go to the next slide? Sure. 
Okay. And so um, I wanted to thank everyone uh, here to be able to be, uh, present and experience from Tech for My Art. Uh, and I thank you all for your time uh, listening to me. I wanted to thank uh, the entire Eastern team for this incredible opportunity to further my practice and share my art on this platform. It has continued to be a great, uh, a great pleasure and gift. And I also wanted to gratefully acknowledge the support of Arts Now in the creation and support of my latest project, Women of Fluid, um, as well. So, uh, finally, special acknowledgments that I wanted to make uh, in the completion of this project. Uh, this has been my most ambitious project to date. Uh, the uh, large scale print in the gallery right now is the uh, biggest dimensions of a project I've ever created. It was extremely ambitious of me. Uh, with my uh, like mid-tier computer. It took a very long time to process all these scans. It took an even longer time to uh, hand, like to do all the detail work on uh, all these scans to prepare them for the digital painting, and then it took even longer to actually digitally paint all of them um, with the computer that I had. Uh, so during this whole stressful process, uh, my parents and my brother have uh, supported me so much. I wanted to thank the um, curator of this entire exhibition, Buster Janae. I wanted to thank Rachel Gilbert and Charlotte May Hoffman, uh, who helped me install the works out in the gallery with them. Like, well, those would not be there because they are very big, very heavy. Um, I wanted to thank, again, Kai Bryan, uh, who I have had uh, the wonderful opportunity to uh, connect with, um, with a uh, artistic uh, meeting during this whole um, project. Again, I wanted to thank my sister and uh, love of my life, Daisy Jeffries, uh, who helped me, who helped push me as uh, both a feminist theorist as a, and uh, an artist. Without her, this project would not have existed at all, period. Uh, I also wanted to thank uh, uh, friends of mine who are also family who are not artists themselves, but without them, uh, this, uh, the labor that I needed to complete this project, uh, I don't think I'm going to finish it in time without the love and care of uh, my sister Shannon Joanna Stone, as well as my sister Zach Rockwell, and as well as my grandmother Lucas Oren Felder, who's also uh, known as Terra Nova. Um, without three of them, this project would not have been completed, uh, or I may have involved because uh, by now it's a to tour on my hair, I'm trying to complete it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, finally, I wanted to thank uh, the same uh, Macaroni and Ethel Brown, uh, who um, indirectly influenced this project of mine because uh, seeing both of your incredible artistic uh, practices even before coming in uh, to this uh, exhibition and then seeing what you've created in the short time that we've had has been uh, such a gift and uh, I, it's such an honor to work alongside of you. Uh, you both of you have pushed me to uh, stick with a project as ambitious as this and so I also wanted to thank both of you personally as well. So that's my artist talk. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, you dropped one on the floor there. Um, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> something <laughs> missing. <laughs> oh, okay. All okay. right. You got this. Oh, I got it. Where's my glasses? I think they just fell by your foot. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm so professional. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, my name is Ethel Formerly Brown, and I guess my main, uh, I guess, uh, photography is my main visual language, and. I'm here to, I, I think my presentation is mostly image heavy just because for the fact that I do photography. So I'll kind of talk a little bit in between. And thank you for coming. <laughs> um, okay, that's me. <laughs> I was like, I think around five or six. No idea um, why we had that photo that day because usually in the Philippines, where I grew up is rural, and we don't normally, we didn't, we don't actually have a camera, or we don't own a camera. So I'm actually not sure what the uh, occasion is that day. And uh, as I wanted to start with this photo because I only have actually a handful of images of, of my childhood, and I think that's why I gravitated towards photography. Um, 
Here's just a few. And weddings, funeral, and I guess if you have finished the school year with an honor, you get a picture. <laughs> Um, we moved to Canada when I was 15. I actually didn't own a camera for for, for my teenage years, or at least I was, until I was 25. Um, I just didn't afford it, couldn't afford it. Thankfully, my niece Carmela, she's my roommate, also my best friend, so we're more like sisters. She always loaned me her camera, and we took pictures of skaters and dance. And also at Youth for Social Justice, I was very involved with at the time. Um, I was one of the, I did, we had photography workshops. We have different creative workshops uh, at the camp. And I was one of the assistants for uh, Jamie Lewis. He used to be a photographer for Evening Telegraph. And I think that really sparked something of me seeing how films were developed at the time. And when we moved to Calgary, Carmela got some Lomo cameras. We had Diana and Fisheye, so we kind of have, got to ex explore a little bit more about different types of cameras and play around with it. And it was like a big day for me. I got this Pentax Super MP Silver when I was, I think, 25 and 26. It was a secondhand camera, and finally saved enough money to buy one. I felt like a real photographer did. <laughs> like being able to document things. And it was a big deal for me to have this camera. I took it around with me when I traveled in Asia. I went backpacking with a friend uh, back, I guess, in 2005, I believe. And um, so, yeah, I took 30 rolls of film and photographed around. So family, friends, well actually this is in Newfoundland, but I traveled around and I took pictures of landscape, but mostly I was fascinated with taking photos of people and I had this sort of weird drive about taking, I don't know, just connecting with people and just there's something about people's faces that I wanted to capture, I think. And, Maybe I was a little bit more influenced by National Geographic at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and this is in the Philippines. And you can see there's a little bit of transition here um, from film to digital. So it's a little bit different in feel. I believe this is my hometown actually in Dumala. It's the mountain where I grew up. And that's the river we used to go swimming in. And this is in my hometown, Dumalat, and I feel like this is the first time I actually invested on a digital camera. This is kind of G9. It wasn't very expensive, it was point and shoot. And it's still kind of, I think, for me, treated as like a manual camera. So I still have the same way of photographing people. And this is, again, my first time getting a DSLR, a D17 Nikon. I think this is the time I kind of experimented my husband now. At the time, he was my boyfriend, gifted me this <laughs> camera. And I kind of just started to experiment a little bit more in, in terms of how I would photograph things, like just different playing with reflections and seeing the light a little bit more in a certain way. And playing with light and shadow, and just sort of, I think, honing in a little bit of my aesthetics in a way um, at that time. And I took a lot of more landscapes on this time of my life, I think, like a little bit less more portraits, and just playing around with a series of things. And then our firstborn was, <laughs> was born in 2011. And I think, again, like how I took photography or pictures shifted in a way. My focus became more on photographing my children and my family. And um, I think there's just the need to photograph the daily 
things that are fleeting at the time. Uh, I begin to focus more, I think, on connection, the details, um, just things that are, it's like, I felt like I was writing a lot better to my children, and I feel like I missed out on those, and this sort of how my life was, I think, for a few years. And during this time also, I think around 2015, 2016, um, I started to capture our everydayness in a little bit more different way, like in an artistic way, sort of combining um, different ways I've learned how to take photographs with life and just approaching it in a different way, documenting our days, but in a different way. I felt like I've seen life in a different way during this time and what it could take, like what it could create, and also just the shenanigans my kids would be up to. I love documenting that. And I, I also like I start to play around a little bit more. I'm always like I'm not techno like I'm not the most technical shooter, I guess. But I try to play a little bit more like with in camera um, exposures, in, in camera exposures at this time, and just really seeing things differently, composition, and playing around with again like I just. And freelancing, so it's kind of sometimes this kind of effect you can get with lens babies and different kinds of cameras. But um, I started playing around with how um, the lens could be removed from the camera, just tilting it slightly, and you can get this different focus and letting the light in in a certain way. And details is also, I thought. This is one of the things that I kind of did focus on um, during this growth. And I think combining those like artistic sort of way of seeing and like honing on those portraits at the beginning, like I was able to translate those with photographing other people other than my kids. I was able to, I think, like take portraits with having the sense of light and faces and how people are. And also at this time, my husband was away for three years, so for university. So I was around with the kids. And photography was an outlet for me to create with my kids. I'm still there, I'm present and I'm just documenting and I wanted to be also in the photographs of my kids, so I found ways to set up the tripod or do a selfie with my main camera. And just to get in the picture, and now here we are with the residency. Um, this question, but where are you really from, was like kind of became center to this work um, with the questions of belonging and identity and being othered. Um, at first, I looked at this question as like, as someone posing that on me, like, that I'm not, you know, because of my color. I get this question sometimes. And I meet people at parties, and I don't mind that because um, we, you know, people are curious, but sometimes this happens when I'm at the grocery store in the lineup, and I felt like, I think sometimes it's just the fact that I'm brown, one always assumes I'm not from here. And also, later on, with the, as the project went on with this question, I felt like it's also pertain to me to look into how do I view myself? Like, where is home for me? Is it in the Philippines? Is it here? Is it both places? So those, that question is kind of became center of my work for this one. 
So these are kind of like the next three images. I was just playing around with text. I wanted to initially do a diptych um, for this project when I proposed the landscape and text, but I didn't know quite know how to do a diptych, like how a text could relate to an image. So I kind of put in the text into the image. I didn't want it huge like, I don't know, like Barbara Kruger would do, she would do a huge text on an image. As a photographer, I wanted to also honor the image and I wanted the text to also be on its own. That's why I was sort of pushing for a diptych. But I didn't know how to grade it at the time. So I tried this and it wasn't quite working. <laughs> so I also tried making portrait and I felt like it was an interesting process but at the same time this I was using a projection and I'm like a natural light photographer so I found it a bit imposing in a way to have I feel like a deer with a headlight and I wasn't sure if I like the process of this way of photographing so and I wasn't super clear, I guess, of the direction I wanted to do with this portraiture. So I was playing around with it and I stopped. I think maybe, perhaps later on, when I have more time, we had only two months to come up with for the show, so it did leave a lot for experimentation, I guess. And I wanted to perhaps revisit this another time, and I would like to photograph other women of color or recent immigrants that came here and explore a little bit more of this idea. And again, um, just kind of looking at identity and this land, what it means. And I don't know, I just kind of had a revelation of having this place as a second, of like as an adoptive mother, I guess, in a way. So I've lived in other places, but I felt like Oktahan Puk or Mimilan left a special mark in my place, in my heart. <laughs> so this is more the process now of um, I did end up doing uh, going with self screening as I initially thought I was going to do self screening or uh, digital text, and Kim really said, "Don't give up on self screening." You can do it. <laughs> uh, I'm not super familiar. I've done cell screening before. I worked at Living Planet, and I've done a couple workshops with cell screening, but I wasn't confident enough I can do it. And I've chatted with her, and she gave me a sense that, yes, there's a way to connect text and an image. Uh, when I did the cell screening process, it was quite an interesting process on its own. Um, I'm, really glad that I ended up doing self-screening to go with the text. It's it's really nice balance for me of the image of the text and honoring both mediums and processes. And it seems like for the text that you do, it seems very like a quick process, but it isn't. It's quite involved to do self-screening. There's a lot of steps and very technical, which I am not. So it's it put a lot of discipline in me, I guess, in a way. So this is my final work here at the gallery. It's so I did the colored um, images with text. And there's four of them, and um, they're 12 by 18. And uh, I went a little smaller with these uh, images because I wanted a little bit more intimate look. That someone has to go in a little bit more to look into this, and it's a little bit more intimate feel to it. And the other part is the black and white uh, images with the text as well. And this is a little. I wanted a big, these are bigger pieces because I wanted them to, I guess, just to have a sense of scale and to kind of for someone to just sit, sit back and look at the ocean and um, 
to actually feel like you're looking at the ocean from away. And I went with the image of the ocean because it's, to me, it represents the connection from Philippines to here with Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean connecting both islands. So for the black and white images, I forgot. <laughs> for the color, it was more focused on, I guess, my experience and of being honored and the juxtaposition of it. And this one is more focused on my internal journey of what this place means to me. That's it, thank you. <laughs> Okay, go. <laughs> Hello, thanks for your coming. Uh, my, name, my name is Nasim. Uh, I'm an artist working with uh, drawing, painting, textile, and printmaking. Uh, I'm originally from Iran, and I have been here since October 2020. Uh, I studied solid state physics, uh, and uh, I have uh, recently been accepted for the LFA program at Mom's uh, Graphic Camp. Uh, my artwork, uh, my artwork is inspired by women's struggles and their feelings, focusing on the pressure caused by social expectation of modern life. Uh, the subjects uh, uh, that I uh, like uh, work with are gender discrimination, censorship, and um, uh, topics uh, considered taboo. Uh, I started uh, uh, working with uh, embroidery on sign internet pads. Uh, I used uh, some uh, special patterns that are typically used by Persian women who weave uh, carpet on the loom. While they work, they recite some local poems. Uh, I think it uh, shows the relationship between women and textile, uh, and also the women monthly bleeding is the ultimate feminine symbol um, uh, and is unfortunately a taboo subject uh, uh, that is uh, often censored. Uh, for me, the attractive part of uh, carpet weaving is the uh, uh, reciting local poems. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, uh, exploring them and their meaning. Uh, I think it shares emotion hidden in the warp and weft of the carpet, inspiring me to make a layers in uh, my artwork uh, to show the secrets that I'm imagining. Uh, in this artwork, uh, uh, I use uh, sanitary pads on the canvas, uh, carpet pattern, uh, uh, and forms, and acrylic color, colors. And as you uh, can see, uh, I did it in the layers. And uh, now you can uh, look in the after dance uh, in the uh, Persian uh, archi uh, architecture's slides. And uh, now you can see some pictures uh, of the interior part of the dance. Uh, there are uh, different materials for designing the dance. These designs, uh, these, uh, these stones uh, are designed by some different materials, like ceramics, uh, bricks and mirrors, or just brick, bricks uh, and uh, mirror or glass. I'm really interested in cutting the uh, mirror uh, together uh, in geometric forms, uh, um, those uh, found in these uh, two pictures. Um, and uh, some years ago, in the following of this uh, fascinating method, I made this piece with uh, using mirror. Here, uh, uh, I combine uh, pads uh, and uh, uh, mirrors uh, to uh, resemble the dance uh, and also uplift the pads and show the normalcy and beauty uh, of the woman's period. Uh, and also the, uh, the uh, continuing to consider uh, 
uh, the relationship between woman and lifestyle. Uh, in this uh, work, uh, the, the pads uh, uh, resemble the brief seed uh, and also uh, uh, I use a uh, uh, pattern of the carpet uh, for embroidery on sanitary pads. Um, and I think is, uh, this work is a kind of interactive work uh, because uh, uh, when people view it, they, uh, uh, they uh, see uh, themselves uh, as a part of the uh, other culture uh, and uh, it influences uh, in their unconscious. Uh, after using uh, uh, pads in my artworks, uh, I, uh, I uh, thought about using other products like hemp in, uh, in, in my artworks. Uh, I decided to uh, um, make a carpet uh, by uh, using tampons and embroidery strips. Uh, I think that the uh, texture looks like two uh, those carpets uh, that inspired me. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to show the secret of the carpet and uh, also uh, again uh, relationship between woman and textile. Uh, finally, I added uh, the video of the carpet baby because I wanted to show the uh, to show its process. In this video, you can see a woman, a local woman, uh, who uh, made a, a traditional loom, and then uh, she um, uh, started to weave uh, uh, a carpet. Uh, while uh, she works, she recites local poems in, in, in Turkish language. Uh, and uh, in this video, you can see more details about carpet weavings, like materials, tools, uh, patterns, uh, and threads. Uh, in all of my artworks in this project, uh, I try to, com uh, to comment on the taboo and the uh, censorship of the, uh, the menstruation in some cultures and societies. Um, in the future, I hope to continue this uh, project uh, because I'm really interested in, uh, in the, this subject and also uh, working with different materials like uh, uh, pads, tampons, mirrors. Uh, in addition, my painting and drawing. Uh, because at first, uh, I think uh, uh, my uh, uh, drawing uh, is a tool uh, that uh, helps me uh, to explore new ideas. Um, art as a tool for uh, change residency has been beneficial uh, in my uh, uh, process of developing. Uh, exploring new ideas and uh, experimenting new materials. Uh, it's been uh, great uh, to work with Bosha uh, uh, as a creator, Rachel uh, as a leader, uh, Kim Grilly, uh, Violet and Esther, uh, and also the EET. Thanks for your attention.